Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Manti Dhakke, and on behalf of the Students' Council at Government Law College, Mumbai, I welcome you all to the third technical session of the three-day international conference on World Constitution, a new horizon of human rights. Former U.S. President Ronald Reagan once said, and I quote, ours was the first revolution in the history of mankind that truly reversed the course of government. And with three little words, we, the people. We, the people, tell the government what to do. It doesn't tell us. We, the people, are the driver. The government is the car. And we decide where it should go and by what route and how fast. Almost all the world's constitutions are documents in which governments tell the people what their privileges are. Our constitution is a document in which we, the people, tell the government what it is allowed to do. We, the people, are free. I unquote. I would now like to welcome our resource person for this session, Shri Kaviti Srinivas Rao, who practices at his own law firm, Kaviti Law Firm. So we are truly honored by your presence here today. I would also like to welcome our chairperson for the session, Professor Hemlata Talesra, who is presently working as a director in Srimadhi K.B. Dave College of Education, Pilvai, North Gujarat University. We are grateful for your presence, ma'am. We will commence this technical session with the keynote address by our resource person for this session today, Sri Kaveti Srinivas Rao Sir, followed by presentations by four paper presenters and concluding with the chairperson's address. I would now like to take this opportunity to introduce our resource person for this session, Sri Kaveti Srinivas Rao Sir. Kaveti Sir pursued LLB from Symbiosis Law College, Pune, and thereafter completed MBA program and earned a master's degree in communication and journalism from Symbiosis Journalism School. He later completed his LLM in Queensland University of Technology, Australia in the year 1995. He completed the Qualified Lawyers Practice course and was admitted to the High Court of England and Wales as a solicitor. Further to his UK education, he completed a course equivalent to Juris Doctor in Brooklyn Law School, New York, USA. He is also Notary Public of the State of New York. So also practices at his own law firm, known as Kaveti Law Firm, which has an international law practice with associate offices in India, USA, UK, and Poland. He also works as a guest faculty professor for many law and management colleges in India. While his achievements are limitless, I now request Sir to kindly deliver the keynote address. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mansi. Thanks uh, for the detailed introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, give my regards to Himlata Madam and uh, Dr. Asmita and um, Professor um, Afroz Sheikh. And, um, you know, good luck to all uh, the young um, students, participants. Um, it is um, indeed an honor uh, to participate in this, um, you know, conference. And because um, the school, um, you know, which you guys are, you know, Dr. Ambedkar was a student and Palkiwala. Palkiwala used to teach us when I was in symbiosis and um, there are many legal luminaries from the school. So I'm really honored and delighted to be with you guys in this afternoon. And, um, and the other thing is I was looking forward, it's a midnight for me in New York City. It's about actually two o'clock, but I still wanted to you know, be with you guys and share some of my wisdom. And um, yeah, I guess um, you know, I was doing some research on this world constitution and human rights. And um, the human rights was, uh, it was a declaration and the effort was done by United Nations Actually, my office is very close. It's on 2nd Avenue and my office is on 7th Avenue. So I get to meet a lot of, um, you know, presidents and prime ministers and scholars in New York uh, because, you know, I, I get to know some people in United Nations. 
Um, I also um, appear in uh, international um, criminal courts. I have filed few cases in ICJ, and I also appear in um, Security Council Geneva. You know, we have filed certain human rights cases. Uh, recently, we filed one case on behalf of uh, uh, care lights, those who died in Nepal. And um, we also filed one case in International Criminal Court on behalf of um, SP Balasubramanian family as against China. So, you know, we, we, we do a lot of pro bono work in terms of uh, human rights. And matter of fact, um, we're just filing one case in uh, Andhra um, because um, on behalf of Tirupati uh, Devasthan. So, you know, I take up uh, cases like that and um, we do a lot of class actions and uh, we do a lot of pro bono work as well. So I am really honored to be here today. And um, I would like to share some of the wisdom uh, which you know, I, I had uh, an opportunity to do some research. First of all, I'm sure, I mean, you guys are all uh, legal luminaries and scholars and, and great students and professors uh, with PhD. Um, I mean, I guess when I looked at uh, world constitution, there is nothing like a world constitution, I guess. But we are trying to, uh, you know, come up saying that it would, what if there is a world constitution which governs all over the world? I mean, United Nations has made an attempt to come up with declaration of human rights and um, after the Second World War, and it's a brilliant document. And uh, when I checked up, most of the countries on the earth are the members of the United Nations, except two or three. That means, I mean, because it's, uh, as everybody knows, the Human Rights Declaration, even though it's an international law, many constitutions and many countries, they try to adopt and enforce the you know, human rights um, into their domestic law. But because a human, a, you know, international law doesn't have an authoritative, uh, uh, it is only persuasive, I guess. So that's the reason, you know, some countries, they don't uh, enforce the international laws or international treaties. The other problem is um, there is, there is no one superior sovereign which controls the whole world. Because, you know, um, to have this, what I'm going to address in my time, in the time which is allocated to me, um, I would like to share that the oldest um, constitution and the shortest is the American constitution. And the biggest and longest constitution is Indian constitution. Isn't that amazing? Both are democratic uh, countries and um, the Indian Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court, these both are the most powerful uh, Supreme Courts on the earth because of their jurisdiction. And um, the Indian uh, constitution is the longest and the shortest is the American constitution. And if you see the history of constitutions, um, they, they go back uh, very far in 1600s and 1700s. I mean, the word, um, you know, the constitution is, um, you know, the way I relate to it as, because we come from India, Vasudeva um, Kutumbo. I'm sure it's a Sanskrit word, everybody knows this, that um, the whole world, you know, world is an entire family. That's what uh, we believe. The world is an entire family. It's all world is our family. But when you see uh, in reality, because there are so many different types of uh, governments, there are so many different types of religions, there are so many different types of cultures, there's so many different types of uh, languages. I guess um, it's not possible uh, to have a you know uniform one document which would govern all the sovereigns. Why? Because if you see the history of the world, you know, there are different types of governments. You know, we have democracy, we have uh, communism, we have capitalism, we have socialism, we have monarchy, we have uh, federalism, 
we have a republicanism, we have, um, you know, tribalism. And if you see Africa, um, you know, my partners are from Africa, I've been to Africa, the tribal leaders, they run the country. It, it is amazing in African law, the way we have the property law in India and America, the property law, the property is governed by the tribal chiefs in Africa. It's a beautiful system. I mean, they have um, the common law system and they have their own African system in terms of marriages. If you follow the common law, English law, then you have one marriage. And if you follow their traditional um, um, you know, tribal law, they can, it's a polygamy society. So I was kind of amazed when I went to Africa a few times. I mean, you know, I get to travel Europe and England and, you know, I, I lived in Australia and Canada. When you see all these countries, every country, they have their own historical background and their, their own uh, political background and their own, um, you know, uh, culture, languages, religion. And religion also plays a very important role. I mean, if you look at Nepal and if you look at uh, Japan, um, Buddhism plays a prominent role. I mean, looking at some Middle Eastern countries, Islamism and Quran and um, Sharia laws has an influence. And if you see the human rights, the, the, there is an influence of Old Testaments and the New Testaments. That means the Christianity, the dogmas of Christianity has influence on the US constitution and even in human rights. So if you see the world, it is so beautiful that with all these different religions and this different cultures and uh, different sovereign uh, setups, um, they have their own laws. I mean, if you see India also, we have Hindu law, we have Christian law, we have Muslim law, we have special legislations. See how it's a conglomerate of so many religious uh, backgrounds we got into our law, we have framed ourselves into personal laws and common law. And if you look at the English law, because it's amazing, English, we, we follow the common law system and, you know, British Empire never has set up, you know, um, the sun has never set in British Empire, but they don't have a constitution. It's amazing. And um, if you see the uh, English uh, background, you know, I, I, I do visit uh, England quite often. They still have this aristocracy. They still have this feudalism and they're still uh, following the democracy. It's a, it's a hybrid. So when you see, I mean, countries like um, um, in the Middle East, um, it's, it's got monarchy and uh, it also has democracy. So if you see um, communism, again, going back to Russia and uh, Soviet Union and uh, United USSR be, before, it, is, it was communism. And if you see, even the religion, one religion also rules, which is Vatican City. I mean, looking at so many different types of sovereigns, I guess, in my opinion, it becomes difficult for the whole world to come and make one constitution. And it, it would be beautiful. Why? Because uh, it, will, it will give a harmony for all over the world. Because it will also establish peace and it will also have a uniform judicial system and there'll be a harmony amongst people. And um, because the way things are going, if you see China, it's becoming supreme in military. And uh, now they have a naval and air bases in many parts of the world, the way they are coming up, the Chinese government. And um, if you see Israel, and um, you know the you know the people are if you see Iran they're coming up with the atomic power. So the way we are looking at in the world, all this they want to have this um, military and supremacy. See if we have this world constitution, it would be so beautiful that we all come together on one platform, and it would also guarantee the fundamental rights, the human rights for the whole of the world, for all the citizens of the world. But is it possible? I don't know. I mean, there should be some attempt, I guess, attempts like this in the world um, by academicians 
and by politicians. The other problem would be the politicians and they want to divide and rule the world. And I guess if the politicians can understand and if they all can come uh, on one platform, the way in the Security Council, they come up with many treaties, if they can come up and say, let's have a uniform constitution for all over the world uh, to have the natural justice and to have uniform rules and to have the uniform code and value system, that would be beautiful. The other problem what I normally see, because when I meet lawyers in New York, there are lawyers coming from France and Spanish background. These are all um, you know, civil, civil court system. And there's again, as you definitely all know, there's a common law system and civil system. So when, when you see, because the codified, civil codified system, and um, they think they're superior, and common law countries, they think they're superior. So coming and um, uh, a drafting a constitution on one platform with this uh, civil system and common law system, I guess there are a lot of challenges we have. The other thing is, if, if we have a, a world constitution, it will be so beautiful that there will not be any more uh, developed nations or developing nations and definitely it will be a push for uh, underdeveloped countries because there'll be a uniformity of economic development all over the world. And again, the other problem which I see is because of the faith, um, you know, because we have Hindu faith, Islamism is different, Christianity is different, Judaism is different. And if I, as I said, in, in many of the African countries, they have their own um, uh, belief structure. I mean, some uh, African countries, they adopted Christianity and some uh, countries they have adopted uh, Islamism. And then some uh, majority of them, they have their own uh, traditional uh, gods and goddesses. Like, you know, the way we see in, in good old days in India, in, in forests, we used to have the, um, you know, forest uh, gods and goddesses. Similar to that in Africa, they have their own, um, um, you know, culture and religion and language, even their, their own panchayat system, their own uh, dispute resolution, um, and their own property law. It's amazing. Um, when I was there in Africa, I was, I was talking to some of the chiefs. They said, I asked them because I was in Ghana. It's a common law country. They speak English. Then I asked them, how does the property law work? They said, um, the chiefs, they look at, they have trees and they say, uh, they, they have the boundaries of trees and they said those trees which they have common trees, that's their property. So whatever the eyesight they go, that's their property. I mean, the government doesn't have no control. It's amazing. So, you know, we, we coming from a common law system, the civil law court, again, if you go to Spain, Spanish and French lawyers, when a lot of French lawyers come to New York uh, for working and we do some deals and, and when we are doing some corporate law, they have a different system altogether. And um, there's no judge-made law. So it's all codified. So I guess there will be a lot of challenges. And, um, and if you see um, predominantly in the Western world, majority of countries, they speak English and they speak French and Spanish and German. And uh, from when, when you look at um, Asia, we also have different languages, I guess the language would also become a barrier in having some sort of a uniform um, you know, uh, constitution. Um, the way we have uh, in America, we have uniform commercial code. What they did with 50 states, they made a, a one uh, commercial code, just like our contract act in India. So similar to that, um, I, I would say, if um, countries like US or this um, major uh, um, you know, country like France, Germany, UK, Canada, and Australia, uh, if they come up and country like India now, if they come up with this idea, I'm sure it will be, it, it is possible and, and it will be a, a better world. The other thing which I would like to share is if you see in, um, in, in, in American, uh, constitution we have in even an American dollar bill, we have 
in, in, in God we trust. But unfortunately, there are some countries which and some um, government which are, which, which are atheist. I mean, they don't believe in God. So, and if you see our, um, you know, um, in our uh, country, we have um, um, Satya Meva Jayati, you know, the truth uh, always wins. So, I mean, looking at uh, so many contradictions, so many challenges, um, you know, I guess the politicians, and it's a, it's a, it's a political process, and the way it's prevalent in the world, I guess it's a lot of challenges we have. But is it impossible? The answer is no. But when you see the world before civilization and before world, world wars and after first and second war, world war, how they have established the United Nations in America, Security Council, and all these international courts in, uh, in, in, in Amsterdam and Poland, you know, we, we do submit ourselves to the international disputes, international arbitration. The movement is there to have the, some sort of uniformity. And even in um, the, the way um, in, in, a, in Africa also, there all the African countries are coming together to have a uniform commercial court in African continent. All their countries are coming together. They want to have a uniform law. The way the Europe has come up with um, a dollar, euro dollar, but they all have come up as a European Union. And similarly, you know, Asia, we all, we all have come together. And if all these continents, if they can work together for the sake of um, you know, prosperity and peace uh, on the, on the, in, the, in the universe, you know, the way that the things are that, um, you know, when you see the, um, uh, the, 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 it's getting privatized. If you see in America, the rockets are getting privatized. Um, you know, Elon Musk, this was never heard before. So in that way, because there's, there's a parliament of, uh, there's association of parliaments coming together in, um, in Europe, they all come together in European Union, all these uh, parliamentarians, and they have come up with a, a uniform law in all of Europe, uh, when you see the Schengen countries. And unfortunately, England has come out of that now, Brexit. So there, is, there are certain positive aspects of it. There are certain political aspects of it. I guess they will we'll have a lot of challenges um, uh, to come up with the uh, world constitution. Um, I guess um, uh, the, other, the other problem in, on, on the earth and the universe we have is there are 6,500 languages. And um, you know, how, would, uh, how would we communicate? Uh, because in the world, people are talking so many different languages, but most powerful are English and French and Spanish and German, of course, you know, some of the Asian languages, but uh, that would be another um, impediment um, to make people understand um, and come up to one common platform. Um, I guess, um, um, yeah, you know, the other, other uh, problems would be uh, sovereignty because um, if you have a world constitution, it would uh, dilute the sovereignty because every country is sovereign. They want to keep their sovereignty. If you see America, it's amazing. We have, uh, this is the only country, if you see, we have three flags. If you see one flag is a national flag and uh, we, we have federalism. And the second flag we have is state flag. Every state in America has their own flags. And third thing is municipal flag, which is county. We have three flags. If you come to New York, you'll see three flags. So all over the country, they, they maintain their sovereignty because um, they say there are certain laws. Let's take an example in New York City. Um, if you, uh, the New York City uh, has passed a law saying that the New York uh, police, uh, if somebody gets arrested and if they don't have a, a green card or a, or a work visa, or if they're un undocumented alien, uh, the, New, the New York City came up with law. They said, we're not going to report to the federal government. Immigration is a federal law. So similar to that, um, there are certain properties, the federal properties and state properties are even being taxed by the city. 
and the, send, the federal employees and state employees are also taxed. So they want to maintain their sovereignty. The, the city has its own sovereign and the state has its own sovereignty and so has the federal government. So when you see country like um, where I live, they want to maintain their sovereignty. So how is it possible uh, to, for the whole world with uh, you know, uh, 196 countries or 198 countries to come up on one platform and dilute the sovereignty? That's another problem I would see. And um, the, the other thing is um, accountability. And uh, let's say if we have a world constitution, uh, how would we make uh, accountable if there's any wrongdoing done by one country? So that means there shall be one court and there shall be one judge making a ruling. And uh, whichever the country does any wrongdoing, there shall be one uh, forum where um, you know, they could be punished. Is it possible? I don't know, and I don't think so. With my little exposure in England and Australia and in America, and uh, you know, it's not possible because we all have so many appeal rights and other things. So, I mean, the way the things, the technology is going, um, I mean, the way we today, uh, look, we, you guys are sitting in Bombay and I'm sitting in New York, seven seas away, but we are all on the same platform. So this was never heard uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago when I was in law school too. And today we have uh, WhatsApp and we have many uh, Facebook and many um, technological revolution. The whole world is coming on one platform on internet. And um, thanks to COVID today, everybody is becoming virtual and most of the employees and most of the conferences and most of the courts, they're all uh, online. So there is a possibility that tomorrow, if not today, Maybe in the future, there could be a world constitution because we're all coming on one platform from all over the world. So I am I'm not skeptical, but there's possibility, but the way that things are going in the world because of this pandemic, that um, all world is working on, on just on a box, which is an internet with through a Zoom or some Skype or some sort of software where it's universal today. So there's a possibility that all the world might come on one platform and make a uniform law, uh, just like uniform commercial code, as I said, you should see, there could be a world constitution. So I am excited and, uh, and I look forward and maybe this could happen during my lifetime. So, I mean, those are my thoughts. And um, if you guys have any uh, questions or anything to contribute, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take it. All right. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. thank you for such an enlightening and enriching address. We sincerely thank you, especially for staying up so late to be a part of this session. <laughs> it is truly a privilege. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for the paper presentations. The general rules for the presentations are as follows. There will be four paper presenters in the session. Each presenter will get a total of 10 minutes to present their papers. Each presenter will have to mandatorily finish their presentations in seven minutes, and the remaining three minutes will be reserved for question and answers. Each presentation will be strictly timed by the moderators, and adequate warnings will be given to the presenters. With this, let us commence. Our first presenter is Mr. Nilesh Bithal Rao Dande who is an assistant professor at law at Government Institute of Forensic Science, Nagpur. Mr. Dande will be presenting on the topic, role of constitution and human right for the protection and promotion of indigenous people in respect of their intellectual property rights. Mr. Nilesh, you may begin with your presentation.
I request you to kindly uh, unmute yourself and begin with the presentation. Oh, okay. So good morning. Very good morning to uh, respected chairman of this technical session, uh, respected principal of government uh, law college, Mumbai, uh, respected dignitaries, and all my dear friends and colleagues. Uh, myself, Nilesh Dhande, Assistant Professor, Government Institute of Forensic Science, Nagpur. Today, I'm going to present uh, my uh, research paper on a particular topic, that is the role of constitution and human right for the protection and promotion of indigenous people in the respect of their intellectual property rights. So the world constitutions and the international instrument, which has been based on the human right aspects, plays a very significant role for the protections and the promotions of the vulnerable group in the society. As we know that the indigenous people who are living in the different sectors of the world, facing the lots of problems nowadays, possessing lots of hereditary intellect uh, at the same time from generation to generation. The constitutions and the human rights principle is having its own parlance to protect and promote the rights of indigenous people in the world. In a developing world, though we are adopting the different international instrument based on the human values, but at the same time, such laws and legal principles effective only when it is prominently implemented by the executive machinery for the benefit of the people at large. Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar has been rightly quoted uh, in the Constitutional Assembly that if you are you have, if you are having the good constitution, but it has been in a bad hand, then the result will always be bad. But if you are having the bad constitution, but that constitution is in good hand, then the result of that constitution is always been good. Okay. So the world constitutions and human rights, many aspects relating to the protections and the promote, uh, promotions of the minority groups are very introduced and well nurtured. But looking forward to the reality, the, the picture is somewhat different. In a civilized and a modern, uh, in a civilized and a modern technological world, we have to basically observe that <clears throat> Uh, we have to fo go forward and look after the way in which we will definitely protect the right of indigenous peoples in the world. Some of the countries in the uh, world having their own constitution and also the human rights principle introduce the concept bearing the protections and the promotions of the indigenous people and also made some reformative amendments in the intellectual property rights also. It is always one of the challenge before the international forum that how we are going to protect the indigenous community rights that are possessing through and getting from culture and tradition. Next slide, please. This research paper uh, really focuses on those basic issues which is faced by the indigenous peoples in the world as well as in India. In the international regime, we adopted the different, different international instrument but fails to protect the basic principle of the indigenous people. As we know that each and every individual having some intellects on that, the indigenous people are also possessing some intellectual uh, hereditary uh, uh, intellect. So in the respect of that, the WPO plays a very significant role to protect the uh, rights of such people. But at the same time, uh, WPO fails to protect the rights of the indigenous people. Intellectual property rights are also known as a legal right, which always govern the use of the creations of the human mind to give the recognitions and the protection of these rights of the recent origin. It has been also been observed that uh, in a uh, in the uh, international platform that uh, though we are not having such type of the law initially uh, in the respect of the intellectual property law. But, but after the advancement of the technology and after the advancement of the modernization and the civilization, it has been recognized by the international community that we have been make a law on the which will protect the real interest of the person who are the real creator of the particular intellect. So at the same time, the intellectual property law has been created by the WPO. But at the same time, it has been also observed that whatever the intellect possessed by the indigenous people, such right couldn't be until protected by the particular law, which is to be incorporated in the constitution and which is also to be incorporated in the human rights also. Next slide, slide please. So the role of so the role of international organization in this respects are very much important. Okay, so in the world constitution and the human rights prospects also, the issues were many times raised, but uh, no one has to take uh, the, these issues in a very sincere way. So basically, uh, many of the time people don't know to whom we will call as an indigenous people. Indigenous peoples are the inheritors, practitioners of the unique cultures and the way of relating the people and the environment. They are having some uh, social, cultural, and economic political characteristics that are distinct from those of the dominant society in which they live. Indigenous peoples are also called as first people, tribal people, aboriginal, orthonauts, 
indigenous people are and the tribal people in many parts of the world do not enjoy their fundamental right which is to been guaranteed by the constitution of any country of the world human rights are the basic fundamental in which that uh, particular community cannot been enjoy but uh, the international labor organization play, which plays a very significant role to protect the rights of the indigenous people and for that in 1953 they have also adopted the convention known as a right of an indigenous people and tribal uh population convention next slides um in india uh, in our constitutions also uh, many uh, basic articles which will be in frame under article 29 to 30 of the uh, which will really protect the rights of the minorities and indig uh, and the indigenous people which possessing the uh, music painting drama folk art and so on they have been possessing such type of the intellect from the forefather and uh, through this platform uh, through this platform uh, it is one of the uh, question in front of us that how we will protect the human rights and intellectual property of uh, these indigenous people which will which which they really possess and which will uh, really uh, useful for them okay so the role of the international perspective in this particular domain is uh, very much important next slides i have been also discuss the international perspective uh, in the particular uh, my speech uh, next slide please so we have been directly on the part of objective objective next slide so i have uh, sir uh, uh, chairperson has rightly stated in his particular speech that uh, there should be some uniform law uh, uniform domain in which uh, the rights of each and every Uh, individual should be protected so one of the objective which i have been frame over here if we want to really protect the rights of the indigenous people uh, we need some uh, uniform and we need some uh, uh, some international instrument which will really helpful for the benefits of these indigenous people that will uh, protect the very basic right so thank you thank you to the organization uh, organizers which will given an opportunity to present my paper okay so thank you thank you all of you um if anyone has any questions kindly unmute yourself or drop it in the chat box anyone wants to ask any questions so we have one question for you um sanilesh i okay so connection connection of it to the world constitution can you explain uh, the connection of your paper to the world constitution so indigenous people is not a concept of an one nation it is a concept of the whole uh, world at all so uh, the indigenous people who are belonging to the uh, different uh, sectors of the world uh, different sectors of the country uh, so in the uh, in the in the respects of the world constitution or in the respects of the uh, human right aspects we need uh, to uh, protect the basic right uh, which is inherited by such indigenous people okay no doubt we are having uh, the uh, some uh, principles in the different constitutions of the world but at the same time if we want to really nurtured whatever the uh, intellect they have we need or we have to work uh, in a very fascinate man manner to protect the uh, intellectual property of such a uh, indigenous person in the world or in the society also next question is could you please suggest some uniform principles which could be included in the world constitution for protection of ipr of indigenous people uh there should be the wipo world intellectual property uh, trips uh, trade related uh, intellectual property but at the same time uh, when we have to go through it uh, it has been observed uh, particularly that uh, the uh, rights uh, which they have been possess the rights which the indigenous possess uh, indigenous people has been possess in the respect of their traditions in the respect of their culture that should not been protected under such type of the instrument 
so the international labor organizations which plays a very significant role in a, a predominant era in the year of 1953 that how we have to protect the rights of such indigenous people in the respect of the character they have been possessed in the respect of uh, various uh, intellectual caliber they have all right do we have any other questions thank you thank you uh, mr nilesh we'll thank move you. on thank to our next thank you very next, much yes we'll move on to our next presenter our next presenter is dr deepa koshik who is an assistant professor of law at vivekananda institute of professional studies affiliated with guru gobind singh in indraprasth university in new delhi and she has also completed her bachelor's in homeopathic medicine from delhi university dr koshik will now be presenting on the topic world constitution and future of human rights dr thank you so Koshik. much thank you so much um good afternoon all myself dr deepa koshik as is rightly mentioned by mansi thank you so much uh, i am the assistant professor working in law department of vivekananda institute of professional studies affiliated to ip university in delhi so my topic for presentation is world constitution future of human rights of people of earth to begin with yeah that is a to begin with as we all know our world is facing various global challenges like ongoing covid pandemic poverty crisis global warming and other environmental issues in addition to terrorism militarism abuse of human rights for decades without any effective solution to all these problems but having a living document in the form of world constitution can be a practical solution to them all a well drafted world constitution will not jeopardize sovereignty of states but will pave way to unite them on the principle of unity in diversity india is one of the best examples of such a unique although lengthy constitution which takes care of socio culturally diverse population along with protection of their rights world constitution will give an outline of structure framework functioning of the world government and its various organs such as world parliament legislature executive and world judiciary setting examples of the constitutions across the globe like constitution of india us britain a part of world constitution should be completely devoted to basic uh, to fundamental universally recognized human rights with an aim to create a public welfare society at large so i hope i have i'm able to convey what my focus is on the uh, human right perspective that can be incorporated in our uh, world constitution looking at the historical perspective in 1948 it was udhr that is Uni universal declaration of human rights that laid a strong foundation of human rights regime in the world in the whole world udhr consists of so many articles affirming an individual's rights including right to life liberty privacy right to have education right to be treated equally without any bias or discrimination so we have examples of rights and liberties being incorporated in the constitutions of different nations that can be the stepping stone to incorporation of these in our world constitution that are like bill of rights in united states fundamental rights in india human rights in canada human rights in uk and likewise now what my focus is on the future of those rights which need to be incorporated in our world constitution to begin with that certain inalienable bill of rights or we can name them as fundamental rights must be incorporated in the constitution which should be honored and implemented there has to be an implementing machinery by all the agencies of government along with their redressal in case of violation by world courts in order to ensure these rights must be in harmony with the rights of other people in the society uh, that is why it is important to impose certain restrictions on these rights that's what uh, the basic we have in our constitution that of course we have fundamental rights but they are not absolute there are reasonable restrictions laid upon them so that they do not infringe the rights of others in the society so following rights are a uh, uh, few of them which i want to name like right to life and liberty to ensure that every citizen of world leads a worthy dignified life right to health and family planning health of course most important aspect we all are 
um, experiencing in this ongoing pandemic that as defined by WHO also, health is not merely absence of disease. It is a state of psychological, mental, social well-being as well. So in this ongoing pandemic evolution from COVID-19 to Delta Omicron variant has re-emphasized the need of making basic health services available, affordable, acceptable, as well as accessible to every person on this earth, irrespective of the fact that he is a citizen of a poor, undeveloped, underdeveloped nation or a developed nation. Like you would have heard of the terms like vaccinationalism, vaccine vacuum that there is a fight for you know uh, availing these vaccines which are being produced so similarly family planning uh, also can prove out to be a population control mechanism which will further improve the quality of life and health of people right to education it cannot be ignored to ensure that majority of population of world is literate and proves to be a boon for upliftment of the future world we are not talking about a particular nation we are focusing on the development of the whole globe whole world at a time so next would be right to equal fair treatment without any discrimination and right to privacy and protection from surveillance so that every individual can lead can enjoy his life without any kind of fear being fear of being observed or life being intruded right to vote and political beliefs freedom of speech and media press a sense of liberty is realized only when people have a right to speak their mind and heart without any fear of authorities, but of course, within reasonable limits. That's my emphasis, um, that of course, within certain limits. Next is uh, freedom to practice religious or non-religious beliefs. People should have this liberty to practice or profess religion they believe in, right? To, be, uh, to uh, live in a pollution-free environment, that is one of the major, you know, climatic issue people across the uh, globe are experiencing. Next is freedom to peaceful assembly and protests, freedom of movement between nations without mandate of visas. This right will unite people across the national barriers, aiding a boom in world economy and development. Next would be protection from arbitrary arrest or detention. Even an accused has a human right, which must be respected by the authorities within possible limits. Right to property, such right will give a sense of independence and ownership to the people, but concentration of wealth will have to be surely checked to prevent its misuse. So uh, to conclude, I would say, as mentioned above, the nations across the globe are fighting with various socio-political, economic, and environmental challenges, which directly or indirectly affects the rights of people and their freedom as well. To safeguard these rights, there is a need to enact a fundamental law of land. That's what we call constitution. So uh, fundamental law of earth, along with incorporation of these so-called basic human rights in it, a world constitution would address all these problems at once. Clearly, that is the only practical way they could be addressed. A well-written and coherent constitution would not abolish nation states. Such constitution would unite the nations under the principle of unity in diversity. The diversity, uniqueness, and cultural differences of the world are precious and important but even these cannot be protected as long as militarism, national economic competition, economic injustice, or environmental destruction and human rights abuses continue to ravage the earth. But along with other fundamental rights, certain directives must also be incorporated as the uh, guidelines to world government to take steps, either through laws, policies, or schemes for effectively implementing these Bill of Rights. Redressal machinery in the form of courts, tribunal, or human rights commission must also be established to conclude incorporation of above mentioned basic human rights in the world constitution is the only way to create a worthy, dignified life of citizens of this earth, paving way towards elimination of global problems such as war, terrorism, environmental crisis, economic challenges, health problems, and trans-border barriers across the world. I'm done, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kaushik. Yeah. Or do we have any? Okay, we have a question. Um, I am wondering if you were able to suggest what kind of machinery should we, uh, what should the world constitution create in protecting the said fundamental rights, given that the current international framework has failed? Uh, I just love our country. Every person should love his country. So I would say I am very much impressed with the kind of constitution we have in India. And that has set an example of, uh, you know, the kind of implementing machinery, kind of writ 
that we provide in our constitution. And as I mentioned in my, in my presentation also, there has to be an international court. We do have ICJ, but I would say there has to be effective uh, redressal mechanism that is to be followed by these through these courts, of course, those international courts should on, only provide remedies and redressal of this kind of grievances in case of violation of these rights, which I have just mentioned. So that's my point of suggestion. If it one more question: uh, If the provisions of the World Constitution will not be binding, will it be accountable enough to protect these rights? And if they are binding, will it not hamper the sovereignty of the countries? You can answer. Uh, I mean. Uh, the answer is hidden in your question itself, sir, because you can see um, what we have experienced about the implementation, about the impossibility of these things in our constitutional machinery framework. Recently, we all experienced what former farmer uh, uh, protest was going on. And I just mentioned right to speak and right to protest is a fundamental right. But every right, as I repeatedly emphasized in my presentation, has certain reasonable limitations or restrictions, which we all, being the citizens of this earth, not only nation, being the citizen of earth, we must abide. And we must respect that to, uh, to ensure that law and order uh, maintenance in our society. We have one more question. Uh, you have rightly highlighted the need of implementing machinery. Could you please suggest composition of such machinery for protection of human rights under the world constitution? Implementing machinery, as I just mentioned, the first question was more or less like this only. And uh, about the implementation and uh, redressal machinery, of course, international government, international uh, uh, courts have to be set up, international human rights commission, uh, they have to be set up, which should actually, you know, they should have that, uh, power that they should not be, uh, uh, you know, uh, tiger papers, they should not be on papers only, they should actually have that much of power to uh, uh, punish, uh, to penalize those who actually violate those provisions. So that's my Thank point. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um, our next presenter is Mrs. Archana Avgad. She is a research scholar from Dr. Punjab Rao Deshmukh. College of Law, Amravati. Being an LLM graduate, she has also done a Master of Arts in English Literature. Mrs. Abghad will be presenting on the topic Refugees, Human Rights, Protection under World Constitution. Mrs. Archana, you may please uh, proceed with your presentation. Uh, very good morning to uh, all the dignitaries present here and all the experts. Uh, myself, Advocate Archana Augard, uh, research scholar uh, from Amravati. My title of the paper is Refugees Human Rights Protection Under World Constitution. Uh, as in the introductory part, yes, next slide, please. Uh, human destiny uh, is in our hands and international peace will honestly cause a beautiful tomorrow. The sector constitution is a movement of worldwide citizen for securing international peace through encouraging amicable relations between international locations of the arena. It believes in the essence of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, that is the arena is one circle of relatives and people ought to now not differentiate among humans. Uh, as uh, and the prevailing article is a, uh, it is the relevance of that human rights are finally understood as a common and unifying expression of all peoples in their most aspiration to live freely and securely in a simply and peacefully global. Uh, my objectives of the studies are, uh, yes, next slide, uh, to generalize the concept of world constitution in protection of refugees, Secondly, to study about application of refugees' human rights under world constitution. Thirdly, to analyze the role of world constitution in human rights of refugees. As every study having the hypothesis, the hypothesis is refugee rights are not delivered as human rights worldwide. In conventional concept of human rights, the concept of human rights isn't always new. As an alternative, human rights are finally understood as a common and unifying expression of all peoples deepest aspiration to stay freely and securely 
in a simply and peacefully at a at globally uh, in the in the as a world, uh, world constitution the world charter and parliament affiliation is a movement of worldwide residents yes next slide please for uh, securing worldwide uh, peace by using encouraging amicable relationship family members between countries of the arena it believes inside the essence of vasudeva kutumbakam that is world is one circle peace is the quintessence of every country uh, country's improvement because it comes together with unity effective wandering and collaboration for the common place appropriate of all if next slide please protection of refugees human rights the body of international human rights regulation has been significantly advanced for the reason that adoption of the charter of the united international locations in 1945 and is rooted within the 1948 conventional statement of human rights that's widely recognized as a source of worldwide normal regulation and is consequently legally binding refugee rights are much more like as human rights in that they evoke some of the equal questions related to the dedication to global treaties compliance with treaty obligations and in, and enforcement at the identical time refugee rights are wonderful due to the fact they observe exclusively to non citizens whereas human rights responsibilities are typically relevant to everybody inside a central authority's jurisdiction the link between the international refugee law and the international human rights law outlining how human rights institutions that is norms treaties and companies would possibly make contribution to refugee protection EU convention european union on human rights it is a dubious if the eu become able to make certain human rights in the time of recent migrant crisis human rights of refugees are one of the most important issues of the world uh, next slide please international legal framework for refugees the league of nations become the frame that brought about the primary worldwide refugee affairs The process started under the League of Nations in 1921. In July 1951, a diplomatic convention in Geneva adopted the convention relating uh, relating to the repatriation of refugees, which was later amended through the 1967 pro protocol. We can say sooner or later, the United Nations for the first time provide an international mechanism to legally understand and provide protection to the refugees. there are some of the states who host huge refugee population but who are either not a party to the 1951 convention and 1961 optional protocol we can quote the example of our nation also and who do not have any laws or policies in location to deal with asylum claims but still they are providing asylum to the asylum seekers in such cases refugee repatriation determinations are achieved by way of subject uh places of the united nations high commissioner uh, that is uh, unhcr after analyzing the literary part uh, every researcher found some sort of conclusions in my research paper also uh, is next uh, slide please uh, the time has now uh, come that alternatively come for fundamental reformulation of refugee law take into account modern reality as world is like a family in the sense of vasudeva kutumbakam that is the world constitution and parliament association wcpa through its moves uh, wants to bridge the gap between the nations and assist them pick out the innovative routes it wishes to clinically cope up with the issue of refugee protection and introduce uh, appropriate legal and institutional measures the worldwide motion of people and the plight of refugees have brought about a chain of controls on human rights the regulation containing the policies had been changed usually and the courts have taken into consideration loads of cases to deal with the insanious problems of refugees states need to collaborate completely at worldwide stage as well as have properly formulated country wide law in order that fundamental rights of refugees are not violated various long lasting solutions are uh, might be formulated that goal at supplying self reliance among refugees that can in addition enhance their probability of finding successful answers to their plights 
India has faced large mass of displacement in records, even has simultaneously succeeding in resolving the refugees problem to a sizable extent. India's way of life of incorporating diverse, uh, diverse cultures has allowed refugee groups like Tibetans with separate social and academic institutions. Peace is the quintessence of every country's improvement because Ma'am. it comes together. Uh, yes, one minute only. Effective wondering and collaboration for the commonplace appropriate for of all. Uh, normative commitment to human rights might also impel extra sympathy for refugees. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, that's all about my presentation. And thank you for your kind listening. And I am grateful to Principal Ma'am and Organizing Committee of Government Law College, Mumbai. Thank you for giving this wonderful opportunity. Okay, we shall begin with the question round. Uh, we have one question for you, ma'am. While considering refugee law, do you think that the principle of non-reformment should be erga omnis or erga omnis partis? Uh, can you pardon please the question? Ketayu, would you like to unmute and ask yourself? Uh, ma'am, I wanted to ask you that while considering refugee law, uh, do you think that the principle of non refoulement should be that of erga omnis or that of erga omnis partis? As uh, the countries who are uh, signatory to the Convention of 1951, so they can have that opportunity to uh, having the non refoulement principles for their countries as uh, in case of our in, uh, nation, uh, as we haven't signatory to the convention. So uh, on the basis of our constitution that uh, uh, some uh, uh, human rights are incorporated in our uh, constitution as fundamental rights. So on the basis of that, we are uh, providing the non refoulement uh, policy um, as we are not signatory to the uh, convention of 1951. Okay, we have one more question. According to you, whether the provisions in the current draft of world constitution are sufficient to address the refugees problem? If not, which additional provisions would you suggest? Yes, uh, as I put it earlier that uh, the countries who are not signatories to the 1951 convention uh, there is no um, international binding on them to assist uh, the refugees or to provide them asylum. So in that aspect, uh, in World Raft, uh, it, it, it is a new concept actually that World constitu Constitution. But uh, um, right now, as uh, globally, we are facing the uh, refugee crisis. So uh, uh, every country... Uh, maybe more or less should uh, uh, should try to uh, have some legal measures to provide uh, asylum to the refugees. Thank you, ma'am. The time is up. Thanks a lot. Um, we move on to our next and final presenter for this session, uh, Ms. Dipanya Valanj, who is a final year LLB student of our college, that is Government Law College, Mumbai. Ms. Valanj will be presenting on the topic Universal Declaration of Human Rights as the World Constitution. Ms. Dipanya, you may begin with your presentation. Please unmute. Deepa, you are on mute. Un I'm unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you very much for giving me this wonderful opportunity. I shall start with my uh, presentation of my paper. The topic of the presentation is UDHR and World Constitution. Uh, since the advent of the era of globalization, there have been much of a discussion about the world being one global village connected with each other. Countries like India, Singapore, uh, Malaysia saw a huge surge of job opportunities in terms of, say, uh, outsource jobs or telecommunication and software. However, these industries got a new taste of virtual working uh, in the pandemic period. These all uh, circumstances, well, this is a very important question 
of the relevance of nation state. Uh, since the world is becoming a global village, it has become very, very easy for everyone to work remotely, to connect with people from different countries without the hassle of immigration. It has also questioned one's own allegiance towards own country and the whole nation state theory. As United Nations is the strong foundation for addressing international issues, mainly concerning the border of nation states, now is the right time to discuss if its scope can be broadened to be looked upon as a global constitution. And that is what I'm going to discuss in this paper. Let's, uh, let us talk about in brief uh, about the history of constitution. Aristotle wrote that the constitution is the way of life of a citizen body. According to Aristotle, citizens, all, or all who share in a civic life of ruling and being ruled in turn. However, in Aristotle's time, Greece was not a unified nation. It consisted of many independent city-states, each with its own form of government. In the modern world, only a nation-state having its own constitution is considered to be of utmost importance for recognitions by other states. Therefore, uh, we can also talk about the constitution of San Marino, which is of the uh, considered to be one of the oldest constitution. Uh, it is important to address this issue over here because when constitution and nation state theory goes hand in hand, and when there is no uh, defining uh, national boundary, the concept of constitution also comes in question. Uh, let us address the question of world constitution. To address the concept of world constitution, one has to ponder upon a role of nation state theory, especially a well-defined physical boundary for recognition of a world constitution. In the world where virtual space has become an integral part of every human being, for a layman to accept the idea of world constitution won't be challenging. One does not need one nation to have one constitution. This can be compared to the success of United Nations, where 193 member states which do not share a mass of land collectively or do not belong to one single nation state adhere to the basic principles laid down by UN and are party to the most, most of the agreements and conventions of UN. Universal Declaration of Human Rights as World Constitution. Now let us look upon if we can use universal, uh, universal Declaration of Human Rights as a foundation for World Constitution. As we all know, man is a social animal and we have been living in a union, be it in a society, civilization or a nation state. There are and there have been some written and unwritten rules we all adhere to. A recent pandemic has made us realize that there are greater challenges to the world than communal, religious or interstate hatred. Constitution is uh, important as it lays down principles and guidelines which are required for people belonging to different ethnic and religious group to live in harmony. As it is stated in India, Sarva Dharma Samabhava. It is a concept embodying the equality of the destination of paths followed by all religions. Since most of the countries, that is 193 uh, member states, already have uh, formed the part of United Nations and have been loyal to its basic structure, it is a time and tested formula to establish a world constitution. Uh, there is one important question we need to address is, can Universal Declaration of Human Rights act as a world constitution? When we look at UDHR, Article 1, 2, and 3, that is right to equality, freedom from discrimination, right to life, liberty, and personal security. The golden triangle of Article 1, 2, 3 of the UDHR, according to me, should serve as a fundamental foundation of the world constitution, which in any given case cannot be suspended, amended, except for right to movement in case of severe security threat or pandemic. However, it should be taken into consideration that some other provisions of UDHR are difficult to execute and much more complex. Let us look at Article 4 of UDHR, which states that no one shall should, should be held in slavery or servitude. Slavery and slave trade shall be prohibited in all the forms. It is very important to define the term slavery by United Nations in order to execute it. For example, countries like US and UK have witnessed the unfortunate history of slave trade and slavery, wherein people from Af African countries were forced on plantation lands and other inhuman jobs for more than 14 hours a day. But in countries like India, we face something called a zamindari system. In this zamindari system, the people who were unable to repay the debt were in many cases uh, kept in Zamindar's homes as slaves who were uh, forced to work. We also call them as bonded laborers. 
and they were not given any remuneration for them. What is important to note that the uh, nature of slavery changes. So it is very important to define what is slavery in a very broad aspects covering all forms of slavery which were which were and which are pertinent in every country in every member state uh, in United Nations. The nature of uh, and therefore it is very very it becomes important to define all these provisions and not just only state them. So uh, there are some provisions in UDHR which can be used as they are, but some which are very very complex and which needs more of a clarification in order to adopt them in world constitution. Uh, let us look at one more proportion. UDHR was written keeping in mind the member states, whereas constitution is written keeping in mind the individual citizens of a country. It is very pertinent to note that UDHR acts for the member states and not for the citizens of the country. Therefore, it has provisions for what a state can and cannot do. But in order to uh, consider UDHR as world constitution, it has to be tailor made for the citizen. Uh, let us look at Article 5. Yeah, yes. If you could conclude in 10 seconds. Okay, sure. So uh, if I have to say about UDHR and uh, member states and constitution to people, in conclusion, I can say that some provisions of UDHR can be used as a foundation or the fundamental uh, provisions for world constitution. Whereas uh, there should be some legislation and acts in place so that we can, uh, you know, use this time-tested formula of UDHR and UN to form a world constitution. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dupanya. Do we have any questions? Please unmute yourself. Okay, we have one question. According to you, whether the existing mechanism of protecting rights under UDHR can be replicated in the world constitution as well. Could you suggest some changes in the implementation mechanism? Thank you very much for that question. As I suggested, some provisions of UDHR, like Article 1, 2, and 3, can be directly adopted for world constitution as there as there is no need for more explanation to them uh, with respect to right to equality, right against discrimination, etc. But there are some provisions of UDHR pertaining to slavery, pertaining to uh, inhuman torture, which needs more of a clarification. There should be legislation to it. And these provisions should be well defined. So in order to incorporate UDHR as world constitution, there has to be a well-defined structure which encompasses broader meaning of all these, uh, uh, all these aspects so that it can protect citizens of every country wherein uh, the nature of all these provisions changes from, say, country to country. And to suggest some changes, I would say that there should be establishment of a world court. Now we already have international court of justice, but that is for the member states and most mostly for uh, say uh, interstate disputes. But in some cases we have also seen that during the Boko Haram crisis in Africa, ICC uh, took a very good stance and uh, that case was fought in ICC for the people of Africa. So in same uh, scenario world like uh, world constitution, there should be mechanisms like world court to address issues arising out of world constitution and its breach, is what I think. Sorry. Do, do we have any other questions? All right. Okay. Thank you. A big thank you to all the participants for such informative paper presentations. I would now like to take this opportunity to introduce our chairperson for this session, Professor Hemlata Talesra. Professor Hemlata, who is presently working as director in Srimati K.B. Dave College of Education, is a writer, researcher, mm -hmm. teacher, and holds administrative positions in many institutions in India and abroad. An eminent educationist, CCEAM fellow, that is Commonwealth Council of Educational Administration and Management, board member and Indian representative of CCEAM. She has received a Lifetime Achievement Award instituted by CCEAM 
कॉमनवेल्थ एजुकेशन एंड पीस अवार्ड जॉन दलवी अवार्ड सागर सरदार पटेल एजुकेशन डेवलपमेंट एंड पीस अवार्ड गुजरात गौरव अवार्ड फॉर हर आउटस्टैंडिंग कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन इन एजुकेशन प्रोफेसर हेमलता हैज ऑल्सो कंप्लीटेड रिसर्च प्रोजेक्ट्स अंडर द ऑस्पी ऑफ कॉमन वेल्थ फाउंडेशन लंडन यू जी सी ई आर आई सी एन सी ई आर टी एम एल वर्मा ट्राइबल रिसर्च एंड ट्रेनिंग इंस्टीट्यूट एंड आई ए एस ई शी हैज मोर देन थर्टी फाइव पब्लिकेशन इन बुक फॉर्म इन द कैपेसिटी ऑफ ऑथरिंग को ऑथरिंग एंड एडिटिंग बुक्स ऑन डिफरेंट इम्पॉर्टेंट एजुकेशनल सब्जेक्ट्स मोर देन हंड्रेड पेपर्स हैव बिन पब्लिश इन इंटरनेशनल एंड नेशनल जर्नल्स she has visited more than 55 countries for del- delivering keynote addresses lectures paper presentation and attended several ccem board meetings she is truly an inspiration to all of us which without much ado i now call upon professor himlata to kindly address the conference thank you thank you thank you very much uh, before my address i Uh, congratulate dr asmita ji and her team of government college of law for uh, this um, very excellent webinar and on a very um, appropriate audio disconnected let us madam uh, unmute yourself himlata madam i think she has joined but yeah okay uh-huh. It's all right. Now you hear? Yes, yes, ma'am. Your yes, voice ma'am. is audible now. So now the trend is going on globalization. One word, one constitution, one education, and one humanity. So to save the, if we want to save the human life, we should. Hmm. I think she has some problem hmm. with audio connectivity. Maybe, yeah, uh, maybe. Please, please rejoin. Okay, lagad. Is there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please continue, ma'am. Okay, okay, okay. Ah, uh, so yes. First of, ah, uh, I also congratulate Dr. Sri Nivasan who has delivered. a very fruitful or knowledgeable and lectures and i agree with him to view that there is uh, no any word parliament but uh, just like dr usha ji i am uh, taking that the so world parliament is in process and uh, the four papers presented by different presenters mr nilesh uh, 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 was on role of constitution and human rights for the protection and promotion of indigenous people and the second presenter was the fourth uh, dr deepa koshi presented her paper on the world constitution and future of human rights 
entered Asuna and Fort, all the presenters were um, very nicely presented. So the word constitution found it. And बार बार लग रहा बार बार बंद हो रहा आपका लगा दो आप दो मिनट में बंद हो रहा है हाँ एक मिनट मैडम बस यस मैम या जस्ट मिनट by uh, the Philip and Margaret as World Committee for a World Constitution Committee and convention organized four World Constituent Assemblies through which hundreds of world citizens wrote the constitution of the world. And the Federation of Earth become Poland and also known as the Earth Constitution. Since 1991, the Earth Constitution is considered as a finished document and the Earth Federation movement has been launched to rectify the uh, Federation of Constitution. So the main of the word Constitution is to work towards a global democracy, embracing all nations, all peoples under the constitution for the Federation of Earth, rectifying the Earth Constitution, and develop the world parliament and enforceable global laws, disarming the nations. And protecting our Glenty Martin. In his keynote address, he emphasizes the broadest function of legitimate law is to protect individual human rights, freedom, and dignity. So, human rights are the heart of the world constitution. Order of a moderate state, not only determining the relationship between the individual groups and state but also fermenting state structures and decision making and the oversight process and the consequences it is a bill of rights constitutes an integral part of the world constitution at the same time gaps in the implementation of human rights at the domestic level, whether individual or whether appropriate collective rights often originate from shortcoming in the area of constitutional laws. So the link between human rights and the world constitution, democratic constitutional order begins with the process leading up to the adoption of a constitution or a constitution before. Such a process premises successful results if it is based on a broad participation of all parts of society. Participants should be able to articulate their views freely and communicate with each other without impediments of the part of those in power. So it is important that their opinions and views are considered in the framework of clear procedures 
provided those responsible for overseeing the process are fair and impartial. So such conditions can only be created when standards of freedom of expression, including the right to communicate one's opinion, freedom of speech and of the media, freedom of association and assembly are upheld. So acting in accordance with the constitution means acting in conformity with human rights and fundamental freedoms is a fair and just manner. So the world constitution will give highest legal guarantee of people's well-being and interest as well as fundamental tools to shape the lives of the people or society and state and the preamble of the world constitution provides the conceptual framework for the whole democracy. It gives us the language of a new world, which promises to use it in an era of peace, prosperity, justice, and harmony. Here I mentioned Dr. Glenn T. Martin. He wrote in his book, Global Holism and Education Transformation, Our Way Forwarded to a World Peace and Transitions. So a world of peace, social justice, and sustainability, the problem concerning social justice in all countries are increasingly becoming global problems which are interrelated and interconnected. And there is a need of rapid transformation towards the wholeness of an economic system that works for everyone, including future generations, and for a political system that abolish work, establish peace, and protect universal human rights, dignity, and our common community. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights includes civil and political, like the rights to life, liberty, free speech, and Right. The basis of human rights is the respect of human life and human dignity. Human rights are the most important component for sustainable development, empower all citizens of the earth to think in terms of the principles of unity and diversity, mutual respect and tolerance with the framework of effective global democracy. The new paradigm of sustainable development establishes linkages across poverty alleviation, human rights, and peace. And to conclude, human rights education is helping to build strong and successful societies with respect all laws under the rule of law all states, justice, and countries owe their people. Thank you very much. I have not taken more time, but in between the internet connection to problem. So thank you very much for giving me the chance. Thank you, Asmita ji. Or I am very delighted and uh, uh, to attend this platform. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your kind, for such kind and inspiring words. I now request everyone to kindly uh, switch on their cameras for a group photo before proceeding with the vote of thanks. Request you to kindly switch on your cameras if possible. Thank you, everyone. I now call upon 
Professor Pandurang Dafal to deliver the word of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mansi. Good afternoon, one and all. As the third session comes to close, I, Mr. Pandurang Bhagwan Dafal, Assistant Professor of English, Government Law College, take this opportunity to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of Government College, Government Law College family. First and foremost, I would like to thank the keynote speaker and resource person of the third session, Sri Kaviti Srinivas Rao sir, for, his, for accepting and gracing the occasion with his uh, views and enriching comments uh, and the insights and all the possibilities of world uh, world constitution in the netizen age he has delivered a speech which was uh, which we uh, all were blessed with to uh, hear secondly i would like to thank uh, professor hemlata pesliya of director srimati kb dave college of education pillai north uttar uh, pradesh university for her uh, beautiful and enriching point of view on the subject she has very well summarized the paper presented and we all thank her for the same i would also like to thank the all the dignitaries and honorable members of uh, the government of maharashtra international national and indian level all the firms judges and high court dignitaries from all over the world and uh, our country for blessing the occasion uh, in the inaugural also i would like to thank our honorable principal whose brain child uh, the late noti for azadi 75 in which we conducted the international conference entitled world constitution new horizon of human rights in this three days international conference that was held on 7th day and would be now on 9 uh, i would like to thank ma'am for it was her brain child thought that we all worked on and uh, the Feast was prepared with a thought. I also would like to thank Professor, the convener of this international conference, Mrs. Sheikh Ma'am, and the co-convener, Mrs. Kuntika Tembur Nekayan, who worked tirelessly to make the conference come alive. I thank both of them from the bottom of my heart. I would like to take this opportunity also to thank the organizing uh, committees, also the anchor, Mansi Darke. Moderator Kritika Dusse, Re-Apparator Devdutt Menon Namit Vora, Technical Support Team. I would like to thank all the paper presenter for presenting and sharing their views on the topics that they have delivered on. I also thank and take this opportunity to thank all the questioners and the discussions which was fully taken on this uh, conference day. In this third session, I would also like to thank without forgetting all the teaching and non-teaching staff of our college, I would then take the opportunity to lastly, but not leastly, thank everyone who has supported, participated, and promoted this international conference of its kind. Uh, I thank everyone from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Over to you, Mansi. Thank you so much, sir. A big thank you to Shri Kaviti Srinivas Rao sir, Professor Hemlata Talresa, all the presenters and participants for making this session a grand success. We will now reconvene at 3 p.m. IST for the fourth technical session on the topic World Constitution, the culmination point of philosophies and ideologies. Thank you all once again for joining. So lunch break is there. We all will come by three. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Emlata, madam, and Kaveti, sir. Thank you very much.